here I'm going to tighten up the sheet of 320 that I keep wrapped around my wider billy stick. You want to keep the paper tight around it or else your stick can fly out from one side or the other. Although I smashed the paper down on the ends of the stick. The stick is eight inches and the paper is nine so I can smush it down on the ends to keep the stick from sliding out. But still you want to roll it as tightly as possible so it, it uh, doesn't move around while you're trying to sand with it. Then I take the stick, turn it an angle slightly, and I go in straight lines. And I reiterate this over and over and over and over and over and over and over. Going in a straight line gets your panel straight. Going in an X pattern does not get your panel straight. And yes, I can cite examples to prove it if necessary. In the end, it all boils down to know-how. And I have 48 years of know-how. What you're watching me do right here, right now, I was doing 48 years ago. I might not have been doing it quite as refined as I'm doing it here because I learned things over the years, but the same basic tool and the same basic pattern I was doing all those years ago, nearly five decades ago, nearly half of 100 years I've been doing this. Those of you that have watched my blocking or Bondo working videos have heard me speak of, of Horizon, and Horizon is the, the eight-foot fluorescent light on the ceiling shining down on your workpiece. And you may be able to get behind this hood and look across the, from the front to the back and not see a, a ripple in it, be straight as an arrow. But then you stand over on the side and get that eight-foot fluorescent light that's running lengthways on the hood, shining down on the hood. And even though from the uh, back to the front, it looked like it didn't have a, a wave in it, well, you look at that eight-foot fluorescent light in that reflection on that panel, and it won't be straight. It'll be going along and then dip down and and back up and just generally you know, widen out. The fluorescent tubes will be going along and then all of a sudden they'll, they'll get further away from each other in the reflection and then come back together. That's the horizon. I'm not explaining every single little thing I do here because that's for another day for another video, but I am seeing black and I'm sanding in whatever method is best to make that black go away. You know, I could take the sandpaper and I'm up bare fingers and just sand in the, in the black spot and make it go away, but that's not the point. The black is there to show you discrepancies in your surface. But uh, that being said, there comes a point, and this hood is that point, where the black no longer means anything. After I finish this blocking, I could prime and block it again, but I'm not going to. This is what I'm referring to as a $10,000 paint job, and I'm not going to block it anymore after this. It's reached its uh, desired result. Now, I was showing you there in the side of that hood scoop, and you can still see it, that black line running there was caused by using a round Durablock when I blocked that before. I was blocking the actual reverse curve down in there, but the roundness of the Durablock at the height of the stroke, you know, I block a reverse curve with that X pattern that we were talking about. And when I come up into that side of that hood scoop, it was digging in too far. Well, now you see me using my flat, narrow stick to take that flat, narrow spot down, back down to flat running that that uh, curved board over it is not the the way to do it when, when you're finishing up. Now, I was showing you there, there was some black next to the uh, reverse curve, and that's another problem, is coming out of that reverse curve into your flat spot, you, you dig out your flat spot and make it no longer flat. And that, my friends, is the knowledge of five decades, is 
knowing what caused that, knowing how to get rid of it, or knowing how not to make it worse first, and then you know bring all your different uh, sections together to where everything comes out right. The most common resto clown I refer to has a 69 Camaro all painted and buffed up and stuff, and he's got the hood leaning up against the wall, and he's working on the grill on the car, but you can see the hood leaning up against the wall, and it's finished, buffed out, and everything's supposed to be laser straight because he used them big, long, stupid plastic blocks and stuff. Well, he, his cameraman's moving around, and so the light reflecting on the hood is moving around, and you can see the dips and, and waves and distortions and all that in it. Yeah, laser straight. Laser straight my eye. Y'all will get a chance to see my uh, $20,000 paint job this year, and I can already tell you that it's a high likelihood that you've never seen anything like it before, ever in your life, because it requires a skill that the junior woodchucks just don't have. You can buy your epoxy primer and use your four foot long goofy block. You can do whatever you want to, but without the skill, you're not gonna create a masterpiece. You have to be a master to create a masterpiece. And those morons can quack all they want to about me using Bondo, but everybody that fixes cars uses Bondo. And those idiots may want to say that I'm using too much Bondo. <laughs> yeah, but they don't even know how to use whatever amount of Bondo they've got. I did not cover this entire hood with Bondo. I only put Bondo where Bondo was necessary. You can go back through my videos last year and see how I did the Bondo work on this hood and got ready for primer. And I've been letting this primer cure for about eight months now, so I'm pretty sure it shrunk up all the way. And my previous board, my aluminum sanding board with wooden handle is about, oh, an inch and a half wider than this stick and about an inch and a half longer than this stick. Well, let's see, nine and three quarters, yeah, inch and three quarters longer than this stick. So as I get closer to perfection, my blocks get shorter, not longer. And uh, I'll say it again, you, you know, can my fellow YouTubers, my YouTube buddies out there that enjoy my videos, I, I'm not trying to hurt your feelings. I'm just telling you straight up, if you've got a 16 inch block, you're wasting time. You should put that thing in the bottom drawer of your toolbox and I don't know what you could use it for, but you shouldn't be using it for doing straight body work and primer blocking because it's the wrong tool. This hood I'm sanding is curved from the back there all the way to the front. It's curved, it's not flat. The hood's not flat anywhere on it. So if you're using a big, long, flat board, well, you're, you're spinning your wheels and, and flattening the curves. And we don't want to flatten the curves. We want her curves to be just like they're supposed to be, not flatter. Who wants, who wants a flatter curve? And that big, long board is going to cause flat spots where flat spots are not supposed to be. And it's all about dexterity and manipulation of the tool. Now this tool is eight inches long and I'm working a spot there that's two inches long, but I'm using two inches of the tool. So if I had a big old long block, it would be kind of hard to use two inches of that tool. And uh, I, I'm sure the, the resto clowns would say, well, I got a different block for every situation. <laughs> well, no, you got a different block because you don't know what you're doing. You don't need all them blocks. I've got five blocks. Well, let's see. When, yeah, I have five blocks that I use on a regular basis and not even on that regular basis. This tool that I'm using right now is for perfecting a job. I don't need to use this tool on every job. And actually, I'm doing a extra step on this $10,000 paint job just for the sake of YouTube so I can demonstrate this block. I would not have done this had it been not for wanting to show how to use this block. It would have been straight enough as it was. I could have 
sprayed my final primer over what I had and hand sanded it with my bare hand without any block and it would have been straight enough to win most of the car shows that you'll go to. But I'm going a, that extra half a mile. I'm not going the whole full mile or else I'd be doing what you're seeing here two more times. Because in this instance, I sprayed that shiny primer on it and I could see stuff that I would uh, you know, work some more if I was gonna be anally critical about the whole job, which I'm not. It's better than it fa was factory, you know, off the showroom floor. So it doesn't need to be any better than that. This is a, a pace car. We want to basically kind of restore it. I'm not trying to do the ultimate show car to it. I just want it to be as nice or nicer than it was when it was built. And if I was not uh, trying to make it kind of original, I would put the hugger orange stripes into the, you know, into the base coat level. I would spray them first and spray the, the white around them and then clear it and then sand the edges out where it didn't have no stripe edges. Well, this is not that kind of job. This is more like a restoration type job. So I'll paint everything white first, then I will assemble the car, then I will lay the stripes out and shoot the stripes on top of the paint like they're supposed to be in a restoration tile style situation. Now, speaking of restoration, I absolutely hate restoration. I have no desire to restore anybody's car. Not that I wouldn't do it, I will do it, but I don't care what your car is, what's wrong with it. The estimate begins at $50,000 and it's going to go up from there, I promise you. That's just like parts chasing. You know, if I get somebody's car and it needs a bunch of parts, I'm not going to be the one on the phone or the internet or anything else trying to find all them parts. If your car needs parts and you want to bring it to me, you better have a line on them parts because I don't want it unless you got all the parts with it because I'm not a parts chaser. Hey, Billy, what you getting so all fired up about? Oh, well, I've done that before you know get cars in and need all this and that and other thing for it and you waste hours and hours trying to find it well you didn't get paid for none of those hours As a matter of fact you you're taking it out of your own pocket and doubling it because you're not working on the vehicle and, and making your money you're idling and spinning your wheels and not making a damn dime so it's a double loss well ain't nobody gonna pass them losses on to me i've learned my lesson now you see that uh black in that valley of the side of the hood scoop. Now we're getting down to the nitty gritty and you want to have a brand new sheet whenever you go to doing that. So that's why I didn't do it while I was there because you need that extra cushion of the full sheet on there whenever you uh, work a little tight reverse curve like that. You saw me tear off a little strip of the sandpaper off the sheet I'm working on right now because it doesn't matter if it's starting to get a little little thin for the flat spots. It's, it's the uh, reverse curve that needs a full sheet and to where it'll pad the edge of the tool while you're working that reverse curve. As a side note, I was uh, sanding the driver's side of the hood, which isn't on video, and up on the hood scoop I had the uh, Next to the reverse curve, I had really low uh, black still showing there where the round dura block had cut out too much out into the flat part of the, the hood. And so I took the stick completely sideways and blocked forward and backward with the hood or with the uh, stick aiming out from the center of the hood towards the, you know, the outside of the hood and was blocking it sideways, which you know, doesn't help the straightness any, but that's the horizon thing I'm always quacking about. I, I need to get that horizon correct before I were even worried about the straightness of the front to back of the hood. On my birthday, May 1st, I'll announce my new channel, the Academy of Automotive Art, and it's a pay-per-view channel. So, you know, you guys can still see lots of free content on this channel, but you're watching this video right now and seeing how long it takes me to, to make a long form video. And 
do all this voiceover and wearing out my vocal cords and all that. So I'm going to be doing tutorials in a, in a very refined manner where I'm describing every little motion that I'm doing. And although you're seeing me doing stuff here, you don't know exactly why or, or William what I'm doing. You know I'm doing something. I'm sanding away, but it's like I've said before, I could watch a YouTube video of a brain surgeon doing brain surgery, but if I did it on my patient, he probably wouldn't be able to talk right when I was done or walk out of the hospital on his hands or something like that. This spot I'm sanding right now, it had a, a low spot next to the center ridge from using the round dura block. And now I've got to make this area perfectly flat again. So I'm just standing with a, with a stick straight, you know, side to side and going up and down with it. And that will correct my horizon there on that flat spot. Now, the black that was showing was showing a minute area of lowness, not a big dent or anything like that. It's kind of like that, that the resto clown's hood that had waviness in it. Well, that would have shown, this spot that I'm standing right now, would have shown enough to where if you got your head down at a, a steep angle, you could see a little bit of low spot there. But to the layman and to the average eye, it would have already looked straight. But that's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about looking good enough for something they can't see. You know, I can't see, so I, I, I do it by feel. You know, the guide coat becomes unnecessary after this blocking. Now, I'm blocking this guide coat off, and the next guide coat will only be to reveal scratches because I normally, on the expensive paint job, $10,000 and up, I would always prime it again after using 150 on it. This red sandpaper is 150. And I would not uh, switch to 320 like I do in this case. I would reprime it and then block it with a stick again with 320 so that there would be no uh, scratches to sand out from the 150. And then actually, after blocking it, with the stick with 320, then I would put the final primer on it. So two steps are skipped here in this video, but as I say, this is a, a hybrid. This is halfway between the $10,000 and the $20,000 paint job. So uh, we're gonna make exception here and block it with 150 and then come back over and block that with 320 before priming it. So there will be some 150 scratch pattern still left here and there when I put the final primer on it, but I will study my shiny primer video to see where those spots were. I saw them while I was priming the car and I pretty much know where they're at, but I'll look at the video again and, and remember where they were before I start hand sanding it so I can concentrate to get those patterns out. That's the reason you want to reprime after blocking with a stick or a board or anything else. You want to reprime because those patterns are hard to get rid of and you're not going to get rid of them very easy without priming over them. If you're doing a, a rush job, so to speak, like I'm going to be doing on the El Camino here in a day or two, I'm going to block it a little bit with 150 and then DA block it the rest of the way with 320. And so it's going to be not the best of, of all worlds, but it'll be good enough. I mean, the car looked completely horrible when we started on it. So when we're done with it, it's going to look pretty nice. And the owner of the El Camino wasn't complaining about the waviness of the bodywork. He was complaining about the bondo cracking because the person who did the bondo work didn't have any clue what they were doing. They put too much hardener in it or not enough or I don't know what they did, but their bondo was cracking in places where it wasn't even thick. 
NASA. Uh, symptom of poor, you know, bodywork skill, and it also can be a symptom of overly cheap product. You know, I don't buy a cheap Bondo for, you know, the cars I'm working on that I expect to be nice. You know, if you're doing a nice job, why would you think something cheap would be good enough for it? Now, I'm not one of those morons that think you have to buy a $100 gallon of Bondo for it to be any good. That's just plain stupid. You're fixing low spots and leveling things out with Bondo. It doesn't need to be a, a mixture of Bondo and, and high dollar glaze. It can just be smooth Bondo. My preferred Bondo is a little less than $50 a gallon. And I was using some Bondo on the uh, El Camino at first that was $85 a gallon, the 3M Bondo. Uh, I promise you that 3M, 3M $85 Bondo is not any better than my U-Pole $48 Bondo. It's all about knowing what you're doing and what you actually need to accomplish a job, not just buying the most expensive stuff so you can say, I buy the most expensive stuff. I'm a professional. I got 20 years experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Morons. Now I'm changing to a new sheet of 150, so it's time to work that reverse curve there at the base of the hood scoop. Now you see I'm going to turn the block up like a knife edge and just run that little short section of block in that valley and this as i've told you before is the only place a reverse curve or a crown are the only place that i do the x pattern there's like 10 layers of sandpaper on each side of that block so it is round you know, not not uh, perfectly round, but it's fairly round on that corner, on that edge. So I'm riding that roundness into the valley, and I'm kind of rocking it there and just staying right in that little uh, section. And once I get the black removed, then I'm going to do a short period of X pattern sanding from the flat spots above and below the reverse curve into the reverse curve to blend it together. This is indeed the most difficult part of blocking to get your reverse curves right, especially when they're small like this one. You want them to stay straight and you don't want them to interfere with the flat uh, on either side of them. Now I am explaining enough here for the, the moderately skilled person to take what I'm teaching you right now and be able to create your own masterpiece showing you things that you didn't know before now that you do know it's going to improve your work dramatically it is my objective and intention to uh, record everything that i know about everything to do with paint and body before i can't do it anymore and i don't know how long that is so that's why i'm putting out so much content so fast because i don't know how much time i've got to work with and I've got a whole lot of stuff left to teach you that you haven't seen yet. We've just touched the tip of the iceberg so far. Got a lot of mo for you. Now I'll give you a little more refined learning here. Instead of I was thinking about speeding it up and getting to the end of this because I'm starting to get tired of quacking but I will talk a little longer about what's going on here. Here I'm sanding straight to get it straight but then I'm going to turn that stick sideways like that again a little steeper and put more pressure near the front of the stick up by that reverse curve of the center of the hood so that I can uh, fix so to speak the, the undercut of the round block that I used last time the round block being too big for the actual reverse curve. That's a uh, fairly small reverse curve, actually not as small as the one at the base of the hood scoop. That one was real small, and the, the uh, Durablock round block did, uh, did damage there. It wasn't damage, but it, it went too far, 
and cut out above the reverse curve and I had to fix that. And we have the same issue here where the round block came out of the reverse curve, you know, to the flat part of the top of the hood scoop and undercut it. So I got to flatten that back out. And now here I'm working on the back of the hood scoop, so I'm not concerning myself with that dropping off perfectly straight there at the back. Now, if it was $20,000 paint job, I would. When I was done, that reflection would be would be Steinway piano flat all the way off the edge of the hood. But I'm not going to that extreme in this case. You saw the uh, video with the shiny primer where I could see the reflection and I would study that reflection to know what I was going to do next because as I told you before after this blocking guide coat no longer helps in the straightening process it becomes a matter of feel and knowledge. I spray the shiny primer or the or the wax and grease remover slow dry that stays wet long enough that I can see what's wrong and I look at the part and I see if it has any discrepancies that need to be taken care of and I determine what I will do you know in the next blocking to eliminate those discrepancies and in the very final blocking there's almost nothing to eliminate but it's a matter of of certainty of absoluteness once you think you've got it right do it one more time to be absolutely sure if that's what you're charging for, then you've got the money to do it, and you just go on and do it. I had a, a body shop owner that paid me $16,800 to do the body work and prep on his Eleanor Mustang. And when it was in the booth, he was painting it himself. He wanted to be the painter of it. He said he was worried about his investment, that it was whether it was going to be worth it or not until he sprayed the first coat of clear and could see that there was absolutely no ripples, no waves, no anything. People would come to the shop and look at the car. Then they would go and bring friends to come look at the car. They would walk around and around and around and look and bend over and study and look and no one could find an imperfection in the car because there was none. I spent 37 hours on the two little quarter panel end caps that kicked up into the Shelby flare to match the trunk. Even at $16,800, uh, I didn't make an excessive amount of money because it took a long time to do it. But I can tell you from uh, my experience and integrity that no one's ever paid me any amount of money that they didn't get their money's worth. I'm old school in both skill and character, and I'm going to do you right. I'm going to do unto you as I'd have done unto myself, only I'll probably do you a little bit better. Now here you see I'm using that edge of the stick to work that reverse curve while I'm doing the flat part, just getting it done as I go so I don't have to uh, get a new piece of sandpaper. I'll go ahead and finish this all together because the flat part of the top of the hood scoop is not as big as the side of the hood so it won't eat up the whole piece of sandpaper. You got the idea now, I'll just skip ahead to a little bit of the 320 blocking. Actually I stopped here to show you the what I was talking about on the blocking the top surface of the hood scoop. I've got the stick sideways in relation to the to the linear uh, span of the hood but you see right there you can see patterns you know, like up and down patterns in that guide coat and that's from blocking back and forth with the wood board or the aluminum board it was leaving uh, kind of ruts so to speak you know, <laughs> they're truly not ruts I mean it's so minute that it barely even would show, but it would show if you looked for it hard. So by blocking it this way, it was already straight the other way, so I don't need to worry about that too much. But by blocking it this way, I get rid of the straight patterns of the previous 
sanding. It's not a very wide area. There you can see that black next to the reverse curve. That's where the round block dug it out, and that's what I'm getting rid of. And I've taken the uh, dull piece of sandpaper off the there so I can cut that fast, and I'm putting more pressure on my right hand that you can see that's up close to the reverse curve so I can take down you know, all the primer flat coming down to that. There you can still see that black spike coming down there. That's what I'm working right now is to to level that out from the from the outside edge of the hood scoop towards the middle. I'm taking all that primer down so it will meet up with that low spot that's you know hardly even a low spot, but it is a low spot. I have a guide cope showing me. Sorry for my sleeve being in the way. I don't have a cameraman, but when I do tutorials, I will. There will be a cameraman like my uh, bad Chad's videos. He's got his, his camera girl, Jolene, doing his camera work, and she's real good at it. Well, I don't have a, a cameraman right now, so I got it on a tripod, and sometimes I get in the way. But you're getting the idea here of what I'm doing. I'm taking it down flat from outside to, to inside, and then I'll go over it one more time back and forth to make sure that the straightness is still there that way, like that, back and forth with the stick turned at a little bit of an angle. Now that you got the idea there, now I'm going to skip ahead to the 320 blocking. Now I'm always leaving the sheet of 320 that's on the stick on there and just rolling up new sandpaper on top of it. That's my, my necessary padding. I like the resto clowns are using, you know, a single layer of sandpaper on a plastic block that clogs up way too quick and causes ripples and, and discrepancies in your surface. This two layers of or two sheets of sandpaper on there, which is like 10 layers of sandpaper, gives you enough cushion to allow for some uh, relief from the buildup of the uh, sludge, we'll call it, even though it's got no water in it, I'll, I'll still call it sludge. Now see, I'm going side to side, and that's with the stick in the long position. So that's taking away that side to side or that up and down blocking that I was doing that I just showed you a second ago. I'm blocking it this way now to take out the patterns of that. Or should I say, just in case there were any patterns to that. And I'm doing my uh, 45 X pattern, whatever you want to call it, up into the curve. And that's how you sand a curved spot with a flat block is at a 45 degree angle you know, with the uh, light pressure. You don't want to push too hard because you might dig in. And here, like I say, I'm just going over everything I've already done with the 320 on the block. So we can uh, call it a day now for the video. Now, if you want to learn how to do this stuff, you know, exacting, and if you don't think that you already have the basic skills necessary to take what I'm showing you here and make it work out the same way for yourself, then I recommend you come to my channel, The Academy of Automotive Art, after May 1st, where we'll be learning about all the, the materials, the equipment, everything. I'll take lots of time to describe in uh, detail the usage of primers and bondos and, and sandpapers and, and tools and everything else. Cover it in great detail to where you can learn to do show cars that can actually win shows. If that's something that appeals to you or you just want to take your old classic car and, and make it a silk purse from a sow's ear, then, then it'll be the channel and the, and the uh, academy for you. You'll be a happy cadet once you graduate from Bondo Billy's Academy of Automotive Art.
you'll be able to tell resto clowns what for. So anyway, please touch my like thingy and share my shizzle and subscribe, damn it!